Wachiska's geographical area stretches through 17 counties in southeastern Nebraska. The organization's mission includes bringing people together to learn about and protect tall grass prairies as important habitats for birds and other wildlife, promote birding and advocate for the natural community that includes human beings. You can track what's happening through Wachiska's website and our Facebook page and learn how to join in activities and events and even volunteer. So with that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Linda Brown, one of our board members, who's going to introduce our speaker this evening. Hello, everybody. Before I introduce Allison Johnson, and it is a pleasure for me to have this opportunity, I understand that several of you were caught a little bit by surprise that Paul Johnsgaard died May 28th. He kind of started to decline about mid-April because he couldn't swallow very well and went into hospice on May 25th. Tom Mangelson and Tiffany Talbot came. His kids, Scott Johnsgaard, Amy and, and his daughter, Karen Johnsgaard, who are on the call tonight, and Ann Balma were there. We all took turns being with Paul those last three days. He was cogent. Tom Mangelson even arranged a phone call between Paul and Jane Goodall in England. And they had, of course, a conversation about books. And Jane was telling him that she was surrounded by all of these childhood books, the big Bible that her grandfather used for preaching. Her, her I mean, she was kind of walking Paul down the stairs and showing him where all the books were in her house. It was a lovely conversation to get in on. Anyway, he would want you to know that in the last four months of his life, he wrote two books and his last, his 105th, will be out very shortly. He would have turned 90 on June 28th. So he, he, I think he would have been feeling really good about the life that he lived. Lots of you have had connections with him, as has Allison. I first heard about Allison when Paul came back from a, an Audubon meeting for donors out at, at Gibbon at Rose Sanctuary. And he said that he, he was talking, you know, he was the, the speaker and this, this young girl was drawing, not really paying attention to him. So eventually he went over and, and checked her drawing out and she might, she was there, she might tell you the story more. But he was really, he was really touched by the fact that she was, he felt like she was a good artist and she was interested in nature. So you know how he gravitated toward people who were interested in nature. Well, probably a month or two later, he told me that he was going to have this big art show at the Great Plains Center and with his photographs and his drawings. And he said, and remember Allison Johnson, that young woman I told you about? I invited her to, do, to color my pencil or my pen and ink drawings. He said, I didn't really want to do that. And I think she'll do fine. I was like, oh my God, you're giving that job to a kid? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but he did and she produced and she, she consulted about colors on the internet. She was, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better student, a more professional student, if you will. So a year later, when Paul was designing a trip to the Galapagos, Yosef Crin and Jackie Canterbury and I were planning to go, and then Jackie couldn't go at the last minute, or it wasn't too last minute, but we were going in a sort of research capacity to, because we knew we would be coming back to do a product. We were gonna put on a show a gallery production at the Great Plains Art Center, comparing 
life in the Galapagos with life on the Great Plains. So we, we went, we were going with a study mindset. When Jackie pulled out, it's like, well, we wanted another person, but you know, you gotta really look around for somebody that's that interested in, you know, the Great Plains and the Galapagos. And almost immediately, both of us thought about Allison, who was, I'm guessing, about 16 by then. And so we called her up, and believe it or not, her parents said, yes, she could go with us. So just, you know, that just shows you the kind of person that she is. She went ahead and got her undergraduate degree at St. Olaf. She got her master's and PhD at the University of Chicago. Now she's a research associ- research assistant, we'll see, assistant research professor, maybe you'll have to say that, Allison, at the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln, although I'm in Denver right now, but in Lincoln. And she just finished teaching ornithology out at Cedar Point Biological Station near Ogallala, something Paul Johnsgar did for at least 20 years. So with that, I'd like to give this program or give the speaker position over to Allison Johnson. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Give me two seconds. Let me get my screen share up and going. Um, All right, that looked good for you guys? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Linda um, stole a lot of my storytelling, <laughs> which is which is fine. But I'll I'll rehash some of that. Um, you know, Linda has been there for all all of the experiences that I've shared with Paul. She's been an absolutely critical part of this period of my life, um, which is has been really wonderful. So the the title of my talk is just kind of broad. Um, because uh, when uh, Wachiska asked me to do this talk, um, it was a bit open-ended in terms of what I got to do. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do a couple of different things. I'm gonna tell you about my relationship with Paul, um, but I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about the science that I do with birds, because of course you're an Audubon group and we should talk some about birds and Paul would want to hear about the birds. And um, I should say, uh, Karen, I don't have any new funny stories, but I can come up with some later for you at a different time if you want. (laughs) Okay, so um, this talk was meant to be done in in honor of Paul's birthday. Um, Of course, as Linda mentioned, we're doing this in celebration of, of Paul's life instead. And I know that many of you probably attended that celebration of life or, or read Arliss's tribute in the Babbling Brook or saw his obituary in the Omaha World Herald. And I know that many of you, of course, knew Paul personally. I know he spoke to Wachiska Audubon quite a bit, which is wonderful. Um, but despite all that, and despite that I'm sort of preaching to a bunch of people who loved Paul a lot, including some of his kids, um, I'll just sort of rehash some of the amazing things that he's done because I think it's an important thing to do. And I'll do this in two different ways. We're gonna do the classic academic here, the things that Paul did because I'm an academic and it it feels necessary. And then I'll talk about um, how I knew Paul. Um, So Paul got his um, bachelor's of science from North Dakota State University in 1953. One kind of funny story is that one of his professors, a botany professor at North Dakota, was actually a really good family friend of mine who also passed away several years ago. Um, This was somebody that my mother grew up um, knowing her whole life. And offhand one year, we mentioned something, 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 Paul Johnsgaard. And he immediately lit up and was like, oh, my God, I bet he thinks I'm dead. so, uh, you know, this is somebody that had taught Paul many, many years ago, but still, um, this would have been about 10 years ago now, still knew who Paul was and was excited to hear who, like, what he'd done and, and how things were going for him. 
He got his master's from Washington State College, um, where he met Lois, who was herself a scientist before becoming a mother to a wonderful family of really uh, amazing, smart kids. Um, he got his PhD from Cornell University, working with Charles Sibley, who was the father of modern avian taxonomy. While Paul's own research was really focused on sort of the evolutionary relationships among waterfowl, um, the work that he did while at Cornell ended up sort of being key in the development of the egg white protein phylogenies and the DNA-DNA hybridization phylogenies that really turned into the first modern taxonomy of birds. Um, and that's something that Paul didn't talk a lot about, but you know, he was more interested in, in behavior of waterfowl, but he was really critical to, to sort of the state of ornithology as we know it today for a, a totally different reason too. Um, in 1961, he joined the faculty at UNL where he advised 12 master's theses and 12 PhD theses. And of course, while he technically retired in 2001, um, as I'm sure all of you are quite aware, he never really retired and he continued to be an absolute presence uh, in Manter Hall um, up until a few months ago. Um, he was constantly working on books. Um, he, his door was almost always open. You could pop in and talk to him whenever you wanted to. In total, as Linda mentioned, he's written over 100 books, an extraordinary number of journal articles, book chapters, reviews, and popular writings. But at the heart of all of that, Paul was really an advocate for the natural world and for conservation in the Great Plains. He was a teacher to all of us, um, whether or not we were academically related to him. And of course, he was a lover of cranes. So one of the last books that he published, um, which will be coming out, I think, in print soon, but it's, it's up online. S is for Sandhill Crane. Um, he wrote, A is for alpha, meaning first or the best. If you're talking of birds, I'll choose cranes over the rest. I think one of Paul's greatest achievements was bringing cranes to all of us. He wrote some of the first books and papers on the amazing phenomenon that is the crane migration through the central flyway and has of course taken many of us personally to see the cranes. And of course, as Linda mentioned, um, the way that I know Paul is through cranes. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of essentially tell you the same story that, that Linda did before getting into some of my own research, which is ultimately the legacy of the, the encouragement that Paul gave to me throughout our friendship. So that photo of Paul that I had up on the screen, um, it, it's been floating around a lot. Uh, I know he used it for several things, but I really love this photo because you always see the cropped version, but I know in the uncropped version, I'm sitting next to him. And I, I look a little bit manically happy. And I think that <laughs> I'll show you a few photos of Paul and I, and that's sort of what they all look like. I either look really stern and concentrating because I'm trying to remember whatever information Paul's giving to me, or I'm really excited about whatever we're doing. So I don't think I photographed well with Paul, but um, it was a good photo. Um, and I think Linda took that, but I'm not actually sure. Um, so as Linda said, uh, I met Paul in Kearney in 2003, the year that they were um, dedicating the Ian Nicholson building at Rowe. And as she mentioned, he had been giving a talk and I, I know that it was about crane behavior, but I don't really know what they were talking about because like she said, I was in the back of the room uh, working on a drawing. Uh, this drawing was of a, a little leopard sitting up at a tree. And I think in hindsight, if I had been able to choose which drawing of mine Paul got to see, it would not have been this one. I'm not a particularly good mammal drawer. I'm much better at birds. Um, but he must have been impressed because he didn't get upset with me, like uh, I think a normal professor would have been, and instead saw this as an opportunity to foster a budding passion for nature and art in a young person. Um, and I think when this happened, I was 14. Um, so in high school. Um, and that afternoon, after we chatted a little bit, he gave me 
um, Song of the North Wind, and he drew in the cover a little snow goose and said, hey, stay in touch. And like Linda mentioned, um, we, we talked back and forth a little bit. Um, and I think that in that first meeting, he had already had plans about roping me into this art exhibit. So this photo of, of Paul is uh, at the Great Plains Museum with um, one of the drawings that I colored for him. Um, so he, you know, he asked me to do this just a few months after we met. And I was sort of in the process of getting interested in science and the, the link between science and natural history, because they've been so tightly linked, you know, to describe um, natural history, uh, people draw things, right? That's how you would document uh, changes, uh, differences in species. Um, and often you had this process of art called um, making of lithograph prints where somebody did an original drawing, it was etched into a plate, and then it was printed multiple times. And the person who did the original drawing, say, you know, James Audubon or uh, John Gould, wouldn't necessarily do the color part because you're printing multiple of them. So in the case of John Gould, who uh, did a lot of famous bird lithographs, including some of the um, birds of paradise, uh, his wife, Elizabeth Gould, was the person who did the vast majority of these colored drawings. So I was sort of getting into this. And when Paul said, hey, do you want to color these drawings for me? I was I was so thrilled. This was like the coolest thing in the world. Um, so in this first meeting with Paul, he really made sure that I'd end up continuing to do artwork and to do something related to the natural world. Um, of course, in addition to art, he made sure to foster a love of birds in the Great Plains as well. Um, the photo on the left is of my first banding experience, which was with Paul at Spring Creek. Um, and then the photo on the right is at, I think, uh, Pioneers Park, and that's my brother Christopher next to me. Um, and Paul is trying to teach me plants. I have to admit that I've only retained a few uh, plant identifications from the Midwest. I got the birds down, but not so much the plants. Um, but probably the, the most uh, pivotal role that, that Paul played in my life was taking me on that Galapagos Island trip with Linda and with Joseph Krenn. Travel is always extremely eye-opening, but by dragging a high schooler along on this trip, um, they really gave me this insane opportunity to see one of the most biologically diverse countries in the world. I got to see endemic species, um, and nothing really drives home the point of the, the importance of endemism like being on an island where you can kind of see to the other side of the island and you know that the birds that you're seeing there are only found on that tiny spit of land. And not only that, but you know, I got to walk around this, this place with Paul Johnsgaard, this naturalist who studied evolution of birds and behavior. Um, so I wanna share just a few photos uh, of some of the birds that we saw in the Galapagos just to, to kind of make the point of just how impactful this was to me. And I want you to imagine that I, so all of these photos on this uh, slide are mine. Um, imagine that Paul is on the other side of the camera with me because, you know, Paul and Linda were always right there with me every step of the way on this trip. Um, and he was probably talking about whatever these birds were doing at the time. So <clears throat> the Galapagos Islands have had just this immense impact on evolutionary biology. And that impact was definitely in, in walking around with Paul and Linda passed on to me. Um, so this, this hood mockingbird or the Espanola mockingbird is a wonderful example of endemism. Um, it illustrates reproductive isolation that leads to speciation. They have crazy social behavior. They're cooperative breeders, which is what I now primarily study, uh, which is really cool. We saw neat cases of sexual selection. We saw courtship and pair bonding on these massive colonies of, of boobies and, and waved albatross. We saw birds that were doing crazy behaviors like kleptoparasitism, where they steal food from essentially just the mouths of other species. Um, and we got other uh, 
really cool observations, like species that follow sort of these ecogeographic rules that are, are so foundational in the field of evolutionary biology and ecology, where, you know, they've moved into an island and we see predictable changes in their morphology. For birds, one of these predictable changes is the loss of flight. Um, because you're trapped on an island and, and sometimes you don't need flight to keep surviving there. So this flightless cormorant is an example of that. You can see his little sad bedraggled wings that he just really uses to, to kind of help steer when he's, he's swimming underwater. And then we saw some sadder examples, but nonetheless important examples of natural selection and competition. So this blue-footed booby chick is, um, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say he's cute, but very cool, uh, but this picture is, is sadder than it appears because that one chick has hatched out much earlier than its sibling. And in all likelihood, the outcome of that was that only the chick that you see there survived because he outcompeted his sibling for access to a resource that the parrots can provide, not fish, but shade, protection from the intense sun um, at the equator. So, I was in high school, I had all these concepts drilled into my mind. I got to walk around with Paul and Linda and Yosef. I got to ask crazy questions and learn about all these species in this natural laboratory for the production and evolution of different species. And of course, the whole time Paul encouraged me to draw, to take photos. Um, this photo is again, one of those not so flattering pictures of me and Paul. Um, <laughs> and it is, you know, I'm, I'm drawing something uh, there and I'm concentrating really, really hard because every evening we'd get back to the boat and Paul would look over my drawings and he'd tell me if I'd done something wrong. And, and he'd always say a quibble. I have a quibble with, you know, the shape of the beak or I have a quibble with um, the number of primary feathers that you put down. Um, but it was such a wonderful experience. You know, I fell in love with science. It was really impossible not to have and not only did Paul introduce me to um, the Galapagos and get me interested in evolution and birds, but he essentially catapulted me into graduate school. Um, before we left on this trip, um, very shortly before actually, um, we went out to uh, Cedar Point Biological Station where uh, Dr. Charles Brown carries out his research on cliff swallows. And at the end of this kind of random meeting, um, Charles, uh, he's, um, if nobody has met Charles, this is Charles. This is a younger version of Charles. Um, I forgot that his beard was that dark. <laughs> um, and then Mary Bomberger Brown is sitting behind him and Paul is over here. And this is my mother, um, Diane Gillis. So at this meeting, Charles said, you know, if you wanna come back after you graduate high school and be a field tech, you're more than welcome to. And so that's what I did. I spent two years um, studying cliff swallows at Cedar Point with Charles. And then I spent another two years in college working on them. And then one year of my graduate work working on swallows. So, you know, Paul was uh, just a huge part of who I became as a scientist. Um, he was ever my teacher, uh, even though I wasn't his student, but that was how he was. You know, if you had an interest and a passion, he would do his absolute utmost to foster that passion in you. And that's what he did for me. Um, so this is sort of who, how I classify myself as a scientist, I guess. I am an evolutionary biologist, I'm a behavioral ecologist, and I am an ornithologist. And I'm interested in understanding social behavior, what causes social behavior, um, how the environment shapes social behavior. And I'm really interested in mixed species flocks, which is the story that I'm going to tell you about today because it's just kind of cool and because you can see mixed species flocks here, even though a lot of what I'm going to talk about takes place in Australia. Um, now, all of these things about me as a scientist, I think I can tie back to Paul. My love of birds came from that first experience holding birds uh, at Spring Creek. My love of evolutionary biology and ecogeography came from the Galapagos. Um, I'm interested in sociality because Paul studied social behavior and, and uh, sexual selection in uh, ducks. And because he introduced me to Charles who also studied social behavior. And 
I think that I actually might like mixed species flocks as much as I do because we spent a lot of time sitting at Linda's kitchen table just looking at all the birds coming into the feeder, which is one of the places that you can see mixed species flocks occur. So now I will switch gears and I'll talk to you about the birds that I work on. So I'm going to give you two little vignettes. The first is uh, about my normal field site in South Australia called Brookfield Conservation Park. And the other is a relatively recent study that uh, the lab that I'm working with here at UNL is doing at Reller Prairie, which is uh, just south of Lincoln. And both of these uh, short share a storyline that is understanding the, the role of communication and the benefits gained by individuals of different species associating with one another. So this is where Brookfield Conservation Park is. It's uh, near Adelaide in South Australia. Um, it's a, a relatively small park. Uh, it was originally uh, a sheep station turned you know, a little conservation area. Um, and my graduate advisor, Dr. Steve Pruitt Jones uh, has worked there for uh, about 30 years uh, studying sociality in fairy wrens. And just because this is cool and to show you what my site looks like, this is Brookfield and this is an echidna walking around at Brookfield. Because if you conjure a picture of Australia in your mind, I can promise you that whatever you're thinking of, we have it at Brookfield. I wouldn't go so far as to call this place outback, but we definitely have all of the classic Australian things. We have echidnas like this lovely buddy who is walking around looking for ants. We've got three species of kangaroos. We've got a whole bunch of really big lizards. We've got wombats. We have venomous snakes um, and we've got venomous spiders up the wazoo. Um, but of course, we also have birds. We have lots and lots of birds. And because you're a bird group, I thought I would very briefly go through and just tell you who all these are because that's fun. Uh, so hopefully you can see my laser pointer. Um, this uh, bird up in the left, that's a wee bill. Um, they're, as, as their name implies, very, very small. Um, we've got white fronted honey eaters. We have Australian magpies, which have absolutely no relation to the magpies that you would see out in Colorado. Um, we've got uh, gray butcher birds. We have inland thornbills. Galahs are just one of the species of parrots that we've got at Brookfield. We have many. Um, Purpleback fairy wrens and splendid fairy wrens, which are who I'll tell you about in a second. Um, this is a Jackie Winter. We've got a purple crowned lorikeet, spotted partilotes, wattle birds, uh, red capped robins, and of course, we have many, many emus at the site. Um, and, and that's just a small number of the species that we have there. We have lots, lots more, but um, it's really just an absolutely wonderful site if you want to do anything bird related. So when I first got to Brookfield, uh, my advisor was working on splendid fairy wrens, which is the, the bright blue bird on the uh, left side of your screen. And he studies cooperative breeding behavior, which is a form of social organization where you have usually a breeding pair that is helped by their offspring from a previous breeding season that have foregone reproduction to hang out with their family and help them rear additional offspring. Um, and it's, it's kind of a bizarre behavior because there are all of these different factors that are involved in the, the size of these conspecific groups and the structure of these groups, because sometimes they're sons, but sometimes they're daughters, and sometimes those helpers are totally unrelated. Um, sometimes birds live in groups of two, and sometimes birds live in groups of nine. And all of those things are influenced by the relatedness of the population, by the availability of territories, by um, the amount of help that those uh, helpers are providing at the nest. Um, changes in the environment from one year to the next. And the cool thing is that we don't fully understand, despite many, many years of studying this behavior, how all of those things interact to generate variation. So that was what I wanted to study. I wanted to study this variation in sociality. So he said, okay, we have these three species, which one do you want to study? And I decided, well, I'm gonna work on the purpleback fairy run, which is the one in the middle, because they were more social than those splendid fairy runs. They weren't quite as cool as white-winged fairy wrens. If at any point 
later somebody wants to ask me about white wing fairy wrens, they are just bizarre and wonderful, but they're really hard to catch. So we decided, okay, you know, let's keep it possible. We're going to leave the white wing fairy wrens out, even though they're probably even more interesting. We'll study the purpleback fairy wrens and we'll continue studying these splendid fairy wrens. So one of the things that we needed to do was to just start understanding the the life history of this species because we hadn't studied it at the site before. So we started looking for nests, we started measuring uh, egg shape, we started looking at chick size uh, and growth rate, we looked at nest success, we looked at group composition, we recorded songs for individual identity, but the two most important things for the story I'm going to tell you was territory mapping and marker capture. So this is a male purpleback fairy run that we banded. Um, and you can see the color bands on his legs. His name is Poi. Uh, his color bands are pink, orange, yellow. Uh, and you can see behind uh, my field tech's hand, there's a mist net there. And so in putting color bands on these birds and in starting to map out these territories, we sort of discovered this weird thing that was going on at the site. And that was that the purpleback fairy wrens and the splendid fairy wrens were hanging out with one another a lot. Um, this is unfortunately the only picture that I actually have of these two species in one frame because they're both very small and they're very fast. <laughs> so not the best photo, but probably the best photo that I've taken uh, since I started working at Brookfield. Um, so one thing about field work in working with especially behavior of a single species is that you tend to get tunnel vision because you only have so much time during the year to collect whatever data you're interested in collecting. You know, we would go out to Brookfield for about three months and that's peak breeding season and we would be frantically finding nests for both of these species. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to, to get that done. But we had this benefit of working on two different species and, and Steve, while he was primarily working on splendids and I was primarily working on purplebacks, we we're trying to help each other, you know. So if, if he saw a purpleback, he'd try and catch it in a net and I'd do the same for the splendids. And we noticed that when we'd catch one species in the net, the other species would come in and respond to its distressed calls. They'd start singing, uh, they'd start doing this crazy display that we call a rodent run. Now, I wish that I had a good video to show you guys uh, this because it's just really cool. So. You imagine a broken wing display of a, um, like a killdeer. This is essentially the fairy wren version of a broken wing display. So they get down on the ground, they puff up their back feathers, they drop their tail down to the ground and they have a very long tail. And then they run back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And they just, they look like little mice. And I don't really understand how this actually deters any predators. I just think it's funny and kind of cute, but this is something that they normally do at their nests. You know, if, if something has found the nest and they're trying to dissuade it from eating its babies, but they would do this for the other species that they were hanging out with when we were catching them in the net. And we thought that was just so odd. And as we started to map out these territories, we noticed that while certainly there are parts of the habitat where you just have splendids or you just have purplebacks, uh, there are lots of places where the two species co-occurred, and if they did co-occur, their territories were, you know, right on top of one another, totally in line with one another. So this is just a, a territory map from one year of our research at Brookfield. The solid black lines are purpleback territories, and the dotted lines are splendid territories, and you can see, certainly for, for many of these territories, those two species seemed like they were co-defending a single territory. And so we got interested in trying to figure out if that was what was really happening. Because, you know, mixed species flocks, while being common in birds, are actually really hard to study. So while you can see mixed species flocks here, um, the vast majority of mixed species flock research comes out of the tropics. And that's because bird diversity is extremely high. And so when a mixed species flock comes through, it's got, you know, 50 different species of birds and maybe 100 individuals. And so it's really, really obvious. But in a situation like that, all you can really record is when the flock happens, um, how long it lasts for, and what species are present in it. You can't really tie it back to fitness. You can't tie it back to survival of individuals. You can't tie it back to reproductive success. 
And you certainly can't tie individual associations to one another because, you know, it's impossible to band that many birds to successfully ID, you know, color bands if you were doing it the way that we're doing it. So we thought, oh my gosh, we have this unprecedented opportunity to understand the benefit of, of mixed species flock associations because fairy wrens like to sit, you know, sort of at eye level and that's perfect. And they're gregarious and they're loud. And the cool thing about these two different species is there were a few differences between them that we thought might lead to a beneficial relationship. One was that splendids like this female are, are very vigilant. Uh, they like to sit up on top of things and look around. So that might be a good reason why this would be a species you'd associate with. And they also forage differently from purplebacks, even though they're both insectivores, these guys are almost exclusively foraging on the ground. Whereas purpleback fairy wrens like to forage up in the tops of the canopy or sort of in bushes or in scrub. So we thought, okay, they can hang out with one another. They can share information but they're not gonna compete with one another. So what we did was, in addition to color banding all of these individuals from these two species, we started to follow them around. Um, we started to record when they were foraging, when they were vigilant, who they were with when they were doing those things. And then we related that back to their reproductive success. So I'm gonna try and keep the number of figures that I show to a, a minimum, but I do have a few. This first one, uh, this figure on the left, this is frequency of vigilance behavior for these two species when they're alone and when they're with their co-residents. So black bars are when they're together, white bars are when they're alone. And as you can see for the purpleback fairy runs, there's this huge decrease in vigilance behavior when they're hanging out with splendids. Um, and that was what we were expecting. What we weren't expecting was that it wouldn't change at all for the splendid fairy runs. And what we think is going on um, we haven't really studied this, but it, it certainly makes sense to me, is that splendids get this extra benefit from being vigilant and alarm calling. And this we do know. Um, so this is a spectrogram of a song, right? So this is just the, the frequency and the, the time uh, over which the song is happening. And this top song is a splendid, uh, this, this first bit is a type one song. And this trill that's at the end is called the type two and they like to attach the type two onto this type one song. But they also like to sing the type two song all by itself. Uh, and when they do it by itself, it's actually sung on top of a predator call, which is kind of crazy. Um, and in doing this, they're piggybacking their individual identity and making sure that females in the area, because these are very promiscuous little birds, they're making sure that females hear them and know that they're there. Um, which is really cool. So let's see if I can get this to play. Whoops. Oops, sorry. Can you guys hear that? There we go. So that's that type one song with the type two suffix. So that was a butcher bird call, which is a predator with a duet on top of it. <laughs> so, so that little trilly bit, that's the, the splendid fairy wren singing on top of the, um, the predator. And, you know, if you do something like you clap your hands or if you're me and you have a allergic reaction to be in a new country and you sneeze all the time, they'll also type two on top of your sneezes. So we think that what's kind of happening here is that the splendids are getting an extra added benefit for being extra vigilant. And so they don't care if the purplebacks are around, they're always gonna sing on top of predator calls. Um, I mentioned that we also expected them to, to occupy different parts of their habitat when they were foraging together because they have different tendencies in, in where they're foraging. And the expectation here was that they would actually become more different when they were associating with one another to, to reduce the likelihood that they would compete. And it turned out that they did exactly the opposite. So when they were alone, they would sort of niche partition. The, the purple backs would be up high where they were good at foraging and the splendids would be down low. But when they were together, they occupied more of the, the space that they could be foraging in. And 
were probably getting information about sort of how to use that space from the other species that they were associating with. Um, and ultimately, that seems to result in beneficial changes in fitness. So this, again, uh, similar graph to what I showed you before, the white bars are when they're alone, um, but this is territory. So a territory without um, a, a friend on it. And the striped black bars are territories with the other species on it. And purpleback fairy wrens, when they're living with splendid fairy wrens, uh, were more likely to fledge young. And this is not significant for splendid fairy wrens, but um, it, it is nearly significant. And we think that probably splendids are getting a lot of benefits from this association too. It's just not quite as obvious how they're benefiting uh, compared to these purpleback fairy wrens. So the other thing that I kind of alluded to was that the individual relationships, the fact that we're seeing the same birds with one another might actually be an important component of forming mixed species flocks. Uh, at this site, these birds might live in a territory for, you know, seven, eight years, and they might be interacting with the same individuals of the other species for that entire time. So we wanted to know, do they know who they're associating with? And it turns out that they probably care, and it probably matters that these associations are not just, you know, brief breeding season associations, but rather lifetime friendships. So I will show you one graph for this, uh, but this playback is probably even more informative than, than the figure that I'll show you. So again, this is a spectrogram. Um, so this is just time. Um, and this is a territory where we played a splendid pair who shared their territory with a purpleback, a purpleback neighbor, so a, a potential intruder. We played this song in their territory simulating uh, an intrusion, a threat, to see if they cared if it was just any old purpleback fairy wren or if it was a friend of theirs. And it turns out, so all of these orange boxes, that, that's the stimulus, that's what I was playing to them, that's the, the song of the purpleback intruder. And those dark blue bars are uh, this female splendid from the territory that we were trialing responding and she she starts responding to this playback treatment about 12 seconds in uh, she flies at the speaker she starts yelling there's actually a, a splendid um, alarm call thrown in there and it takes her friend her co-resident uh, about to the end of that first playback stimulus which was about a minute long to realize that there was also a purpleback intruding on his territory too, and he came in to help her. So the two of them together approached the speaker, were yelling at it, were displaying, and, and this was really dramatic. I, th I thought that this experiment wouldn't work. It didn't make sense to me that they would bother to learn the individual songs of their friends, but it turns out that they do. So this figure is essentially summing that up in a, a slightly more scientific way. Um, so, this is just the strength of response. So it's kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of different things we recorded, including you know, scolding, singing, approaching and displaying. And we did four different treatments, a control, which was a species that they just don't care about at all. They, they aren't aggressive towards it. They don't hang out with it. Um, their friend, their co-resident, um, a neighbor, of the other species, and then a, a member of the other species that they just never heard before from many, many territories away. And it turns out that they are quite aggressive towards these intruding birds, but they recognize their friends and they aren't aggressive towards them. And anecdotally from just doing this experiment a whole bunch of times, uh, they would often get confused because they'd hear um, their, their friend singing in two different places. And so they would go looking for them. You'd watch them kind of move through the territory and then find their co-resident and, and hang out with them and follow them around and kind of keep looking back at the speaker like, I don't understand why you're singing from over there. Um, it was a really cool experiment. Um, so now, of course, I'm, I'm working at UNL with um, new collaborators. I work with Dai Shizuka and some of his graduate students, including Laura Vandermeiden. And 
I mentioned at the beginning, one of the pitfalls of working on a single species is that you get a bit of tunnel vision. Well, it turned out that even if you work on two species, sometimes you get a little bit of tunnel vision because Laura is also interested in mixed species flocks. And when I arrived at UNL, she said, so what are the other species doing? And I was like, what do you mean? What are the other species doing? <laughs> and she was totally right. We started collecting data on not just the fairy wrens, but on all of these other species in the habitat. And we started putting color bands on all of these other species. And it turns out that all of these other birds that are in the habitat, except emus, emus don't really participate, <laughs> um, are forming mixed species flocks and interacting with one another. So, you know, if at any later point you guys want to hear more about this story, um, I'm sure Laura would love to share it with you. She's interested in understanding this from an even broader perspective, asking some of the same questions I do, uh, but with more species. Now, this figure that's here, I don't know if anybody's familiar with social network analysis, but this is a social network. It's essentially just friendships, right? So each line is an interaction between one species and another. And all of those little four letter letter codes are just our species codes. You don't need to worry about who's who, but I wanted to show it to you just because it's just this crazy spider web. Everybody's interacting with everybody else. But also I wanted to show it to you because this figure does vindicate my focus on fairy runs just a little bit. So the top two um, species, uh, this is the splendid fairy run and this is the purple back fairy run. And they're so far removed from the rest of that network because their relationship with one another is much, much tighter than their relationship to anybody else. Um, so this is my vindication for, for my focus and my tunnel vision. So very quickly, I will share one more vignette about uh, some mixed species flock research that we're doing in Nebraska uh, at Reller Prairie. Uh, this is a, a not super well-known field site uh, that UNL owns. It's down near Sprague and it's called a prairie. And I suppose technically there is a plot of it that is prairie, but it's mostly woodland. And because it's woodland, we get wonderful uh, winter mixed species flocks there. We get uh, chickadees, nuthatches, um, woodpeckers, and uh, a couple other neat species. And because Laura and I weren't able to go to Australia this year, we decided that it would be awesome to do some work at Reller Prairie looking at these winter mixed species flocks, which um, some of the other members of the lab, including Laura, have already started to look at at Pioneers Park. And so she and another graduate student of Dai's um, Faiza Hafiz was interested in understanding the role of communication in these flocks and whether or not there were consistent relationships here like we were seeing at Brookfield. But because it's winter and we didn't want to walk around and look at color bands all the time when it's really cold out and because nuthatches like to hang on the sides of trees where you can't really read color bands super well, we did this in a totally different way. So we used what we call RFID feeders. So if you look at that feeder in the bottom right picture, it's got a little black thing attached to uh, the feeder platform and underneath of it is a circuit board because we have banded these birds with a, a little radio tag. So this little green band on this chickadee, this green band on this uh, white-breasted nuthatch. Um, and when a bird lands on this RFID feeder, the RFID feeder pings it and it says, okay, it was bird number, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and that way we can tell down to the second who was present at the feeder, how many times they visited, the duration of time that they were there, and who followed up at that feeder after them. It's really cool. It produces an insane amount of data. Um, it didn't super love the, the cold, so the batteries died on us a lot, but um, it allowed us to look at winter mixed species flocks consisting of these guys. Um, and we had some expectations about what these flocks would look like because there's previous work looking at uh, chickadees as what we like to call nuclear species. Um, and that term is not the best word to describe their role, but essentially 
these are species that initiate flocks um, rather than join them. So follower species or satellite species would be species that join up and chickadees are leaders. Essentially when there's a chickadee, other things will join them. And this is probably the case because chickadees uh, have very informative calls. Um, so that classic chickadee call um, that you're probably familiar with um, has some information about the threat level of predators that are around it. So the more D notes that they attach to the chickadee call, so, you know, D, 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 the more Ds, the, the scarier the thing is. And it corresponds to, with avian predators, wing size, because the smaller the predator is, the actually the more threatening it is, at least to chickadees, because a saw wet owl might eat a chickadee, but probably a great gray owl isn't going to bother. So maybe you wanna hang out with chickadees because they make calls like this. That's a very upset chickadee, it's a lot of Ds. <laughs> And we also know from other work that uh, chickadees are important because when chickadees are removed from the habitat, other species are more vigilant and they don't form flocks on their own. So species like chickadees, tit mice also seem to fill this role, appear to be very important, but the way that we've addressed this is through sort of removal experiments. And that's not always the best type of experiment because it, it has its own set of problems. And we thought, well, if we've got this feeder system set up, we can really easily look at who's coming to the feeder, who leads, who follows, um, and we can look at communication. So what we did was do some preliminary observations of all these feeders that are set up at Reller Prairie just to look at social network analysis. And that is something that I, I won't talk about today um, because as I mentioned, it's a lot of data. We're still kind of sifting through it, but um, we figured we could take down a bunch of these feeders and we could put up novel feeders and associate those feeders with playback calls of chickadees or nut hatches or just kind of white noise, so no information at all, and see if birds were better or worse at finding feeders that had chickadee calls associated with them. So this is just, uh, this is Faiza and Laura putting up this experiment. Uh, so Faiza's got this cool Bluetooth speaker. Uh, you're looking at the, co the GoPro that's videotaping um, the experiment because even though we tried to band all of the birds, we can't get everybody banded and there are lots of unbanded species. So we, we focused on just a few, but other species are also visiting this feeder. We were recording bird calls. Um, and then of course we have the RFID feeder itself that's recording data for us. So this was sort of our escape from uh, isolation. We got to go out into the field and, and just play around with chickadees, it was fun. And this is what happened. <laughs> uh, we got lots of goldfinches. It turns out that goldfinches uh, find feeders faster than anything else. And they spend almost the entire time sitting on the feeder uh, and they have to get kicked off by other species, which was kind of not something we were expecting, but kind of fun. Um, and you can see from this, if I let it keep running, and I'll, I'll stop it in a second, but we get white-breasted nut hatches, chickadees come in, a cardinal comes in at some point, the goldfinches keep landing on the top of the GoPro. Um, it's really very active. There are dark-eyed juncos hopping around on the ground. And <clears throat> this is what we've found so far. Faiza is still working her way through this data, but essentially, the expectation that chickadees are important in these mixed species foraging flocks seems to hold true. Um, so this figure is latency to arrival, essentially how fast the feeder was found and feeders that were playing chickadee calls at them were found the fastest. So they didn't seem to be paying attention to the quaint calls of the white-breasted nuthatch and they didn't care about the white noise. They'd find those two at about the same speed and then the figure on the right is just uh, mean latency to arrival for different species. You can see that the goldfinches, amgos, uh, they found everything fastest. Um, there were a few videos where we would step out of the frame and immediately a goldfinch would fly into the, the feeder and start eating. Um, and it seems like the white-breasted nuthatches are the species that are cluing in beyond the, the goldfinches to that chickadee call the fastest, which is kind of neat. 
So the work that they're doing now is trying to understand how the social network that they gathered relates to the, the food finding network that they've got. And this is just, again, a social network that I think is cool to show you. Here, this is a bit different than the other one that I, I showed you because each of those dots is an individual and it's colored by species. So yellow is black capped chickadees, uh, green is downy woodpeckers, white is white breasted nuthatches, and red is red bellied woodpeckers. And you can see that there are relationships that are tight between members of the same species. So it seems like the white breasted nuthatches already are in breeding pairs, they seem to be in twos, but they have really tight connections to specific individuals of the other species. So that's what we're starting to dig into here, you know, whether or not these tight relationships between different species matter for food finding and attendance at those feeders. So just to, to kind of close all that up, wrap it together and tie those two little vignettes together, there are definitely beneficial fitness consequences to associating with other species. And it's uh, in part mediated by communication. And it seems that individual identity is probably a much, much bigger factor in the formation of these mixed species flocks than has been sort of uh, understood prior to now. And then I'll say, of course, keep your eyes open, don't get tunnel vision because all of these birds that are hanging out in our backyards at Nine Mile Prairie, at Pioneers Park, they're hanging out with other species and they're doing it all the time. And it ends up being that this is a very complex social structure that's a bit hidden to us. And then I want to, of course, thank all the people that have been involved in, in my science, like the, the aspect of this that has been collected since graduate school, all of my collaborators and mentors, especially Dai Shizuka and Steve Pro Jones, the Shizuka lab members, including all of the wonderful grad students that are working on all of these projects, um, the field techs that have come out to Australia with us, some of our funding sources. And then, of course, I want to thank Paul. So that, if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Uh, I talked a little longer than I wanted to, but hopefully it wasn't too, too bad. No, that, that was great. Very, very interesting. Uh, questions, we'll open it up. Hi, uh, this is Bruce Melbert. I uh, attended uh, Paul's um, ornithology class and also his uh, graduate level animal behavior. And I remember him speaking at one point about what he called foraging guilds, which included black cap, black, black cap chickadees, um, nut hatches, white breasted nut hatches, and also juncos sweeping through winter environments, trees and such. So this is uh, matching up with what I remember. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> Does that term ring up for you? For oh you? yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and kind of one of the weird things about certainly the, the winter species here is that the nut hatches and the chickadees are caching as they're foraging for all these seeds, which we don't have to deal with that in Australia, but as a result, you know, especially with these feeders, we see them, they, they land on the feeder and then they leave and then they land on the feeder and they leave. And it's because they're, they're not eating, they're caching and it's just, it's kind of weird and, and very cool. <laughs> Gotta love chickadees. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Oh, I muted myself. Allison, <laughs> what's so unique about the white winged fairy wren? Oh, they have what we call, they're, they're still classified as cooperative breeders, um, but they form clans where that, that bright male, uh, let's see if I can go back just because the picture is pretty. Um, almost there. So, so that, that male or, or that is a male, I should say, the, the bright bluebird's a male. 
and they only turn that color when they're about four years old. And up till that point, they're kind of a drab brown and they look like females. Sometimes their bills will turn black. So you might be able to identify males by that trait. But for the most part, um, sex is sort of cryptic up until they get to this bright blue stage. And in a population, you might only have one or two males that are bright blue like that. And they kind of lord over all of these other smaller cooperative breeding groups where you have a dull male who's breeding with a female and they might have their own helpers. And that male will mate with that female, but this male, the bright male, will get extra pair of copulations. He'll, he'll also mate with that female and he'll mate with all of the other females in the area. So they're just, they're so weird. They're so hard to study. And they're out in this habitat that we call blue bush, which is kind of like... Um, uh, sagebrush, where it's it's very mm -hmm. open. You have a bunch of small bushes, and these guys will just pop up, and they will fly, and they will fly, and they'll fly, and you'll never catch them in your net. They're <laughs> they're really cool. One day, mm -hmm. maybe <laughs> it'd be fun to work yeah, on these guys. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a book that would be on uh, bird songs that have to do with these habitats and so the details that you kind of people would uh, study, not, not, not the bird ID kind of um, stuff. I read, I really struggled through a book by Don Krodzma, maybe one of his early books, it was hardcover. <laughs> and yes, there was one chapter that really explained it, but it was a struggle. <laughs> I can definitely think of a couple books. Um... I'm going to blank on the titles, but there's there's one wonderful one on Australian birdsong that uh, I absolutely love. I will send Arliss an email with some suggestions for you as soon as we, we end. And if Arliss, if you'd be willing to pass that on. Um, I sure will. Okay, so, thanks. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Allison. What's the status, the status about going back to Australia? Uh, you know it at the moment. That is that is the worst question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. It it's not looking great. Um, vaccine rollout is not particularly fast. Uh, so probably not this year. Maybe maybe early next year. That's kind of my hope right now. How long do fairy wrens live? Will, your, will you still have some alive? We still do right now. I've got a friend who absolutely loves birding at Brookfield. And every time she goes out to the site, she sends me a picture of one of my banded birds, which is almost a little bit painful. I kind of want to be like, please, Claire, stop. <laughs> but it's nice, to, it's nice to know that they're still going strong. And she's going to help do a survey this year just to see because one of the most important things about having a long-term site like this is just understanding which birds live. So she'll go back out there and, and help me do just color band recording um, when it hits spring, which is fall for us. Allison, this is Scott. Quick question. Do yeah. splendids, looking at their larger range, do splendids and purplebacks always co-occur? Or are there areas where splendids only live, by, you know, or only purplebacks live, or do they yeah. basically always co-occur? They definitely don't always co-occur. Um, the the range of the purpleback is quite large, but there are places where splendids will overlap with other species, and where purplebacks will also overlap with different species. And there's a pretty big group of fairy run researchers uh, because they're pretty and they're gregarious, and everybody loves them. And from talking with all of those wonderful people, we've discovered that this is happening at all of their field sites too, uh, with different species. So uh -huh. um, it's just really cool and, and really nuts, but it, it does kind of illustrate the flexibility of social behaviors like this because, and, and this is true for here too, if you have mixed species flocks, like the home range or the, the I, not the home range, but the, just the range of each of these species varies. So you have to learn different individuals, different species, depending on where in that range you are. Um, yeah, 
it was kind of cool. Yeah, and these are of course non-migratory birds, but I wonder yeah. do migratory and non-migratory also benefit from sort of co-occurrence maybe on wintering range or or elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. Um, which even further complicates things. Um, you know, there's evidence that things like warblers, when they go down into the tropics, they form mixed species flocks uh, uh -huh. with species that they might not share breeding grounds with. Um, at Brookfield, we've got a whole bunch of different um, movement life histories. So we have these species that are, are living there all year round. We have other species that are nomadic. Um, and then we have migratory species and we see them engaging in these mixed species flocks to different degrees. Um, but the stability of those relationships seems to change depending on how often they're present, um, which is not terribly surprising, I guess. Huh. So interestingly then on a wintering grounds where breeding success is not so much an issue, there's still benefits obtained from uh, you know, multi, multi-species. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Our listeners, are, are you finding any questions in the chat box? Well, I've, they've been sending some to me for different things they want, but I don't think there's any <laughs> to pass along. Okay. I got a question for you, Allison. Uh, how are the populations doing demographically in terms of numeric, in terms of the numbers? Are there any trend numbers on how the populations are responding, particularly as it relates to the fires that have been going through Australia? Yeah, good question. Um, so we were lucky. The site that I work at did not have any fires, but we did have a, a massive heat wave and pretty substantial die off. So uh, we were one of those sites where it wasn't as well publicized as the fires because obviously the fires were extraordinarily devastating, but other regions had birds dropping dead from the trees because of the heat wave. And it was uh, about an eight day stretch of over a hundred degree days. Um, mm -hmm. And there was definitely an impact um, on this population, which was unfortunate. I think we've, we've observed just over the last several years that there's generally been a decline in species at this site and the site has been uh, impacted certainly by climate change. Um, I know some researchers who were working on places like Kangaroo Island where there were fires um, and it, it, was, it was pretty devastating but I have to say talking to her afterwards when all of the the plants were starting to come back. They did have fairy wrens coming out of the woodworks that made it and their the population is not in decline. It's it's definitely coming back a little bit, but it's of course limping along. It got got hurt. Allison, Great question. Mm -hmm. here's uh, one question we just got is please explain caching. <laughs> sure, sorry. <laughs> so caching is where, um, and, and this is not just birds, other species do it too, where you store food. So you don't eat it right in that moment. Um, you might not even be eating it that year. There are some species that will like acorn woodpeckers that have what are called granaries where they store acorns for sort of a rainy day. It's, it's essentially their emergency stash of food. So that's what, you know, if you ever watch a feeder and there's a chickadee that's just like going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, it's not eating, it's shoving the food into a crack in a tree, uh, you know, in the bark or, or in a hole that it's found um, so that if one afternoon you forgot to fill the feeder, it's still got some food to, to munch on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are they pretty successful in finding the food? What the ah. they've cached? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know for chickadees, but uh, there are other species that cache like, um, oh, scrub jays. Scrub jays mm -hmm. will cache acorns and they'll do it in, you know, if they're in Florida, they'll do it in sand and their memory is amazingly good. And the use of their, their cache will depend on what type of food they put in it. So if they put in a bug, something that's going to decay really fast. They'll eat that first. Like they'll go back and find that one first and they'll leave the acorns for later. So there's like a lot of cool stuff going on, but 
they do forget some of them. And that's why some of those species are, are considered sort of ecosystem engineers because they're planting the acorn forest as they're going because they just, they can't remember where they put all of them. Great question. Thank you. Any, any other questions for Allison? Well, it's clear that Dr. Johnsgaard was uh, a want ace on when he found you as a teenager and, and mentored you. Yeah, you've done great. Uh, got a great, great life ahead. Tim, did you have a question? I saw you raising your hand. Muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I was going to ask if ask if there's any explanation for how why chickadees seem to have such a Oh, leadership role in, in these mixed flocks. Is there something about their uh, brain or something? Uh, their... Yeah. I don't know. Good question. And we're not totally sure that the idea that their calls are super informative is one thing mm -hmm. um, that people think might be a reason to follow a chickadee and not something else. Um, but you know, we don't know, like a lot of these studies, there are a lot of mixed species studies uh, that have happened over the years, but they're, they're more anecdotal, they're more uh, observational. And so hopefully, you know, maybe I'll be able to tell you something at a later point, looking at how these birds are associating and when they're doing it and why. But at this point, we're not entirely sure. We just know that, and it's not just chickadees, it's like chickadees and their relatives. So tit mice, um, great tits in the US or not in the US, sorry, in Europe, all of the, the relatives of chickadees seem to play that role. And we don't really know why that's the case. Okay. Well, anyone else? No. <laughs> that, that just leads me to another question. Is there some way to sort of measure the intelligence of birds? I always thought chickadees were smart. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I would say that they're all pretty smart and we, we probably don't give them as much credit as they deserve. It, it's kind of a hard thing to study. Um, and it's not something that I've ever been interested in studying because you get into the realm of psychology and then people get really picky about the types of words that you use and, and what is intelligence and, you know, what is memory? And if you're measuring memory, is it active memory? Is it long-term memory? Is it short-term memory? So it's, I will say it's a bit of a mess, but species, <laughs> especially like chickadees that are caching species, there's a lot of evidence that they have really good memories um, and they have complex social systems. They remember individuals year after year after year. They remember us, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I would say, most birds are pretty smart, but the way that we get at that is interesting because it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer. In my neighborhood, I would say the blue jay is the smart and, and the key to our neighborhood. Yeah. Jays, jays and crows, they are, they are quite smart. Yep. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, let's give uh, Allison a, a round of applause. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And, and we thank Paul's family members for also, also joining us this evening. And uh, with that, I, I think we're finished for the night. Very good presentation, Allison. Enjoy. Thank you. Yes, thank you for, for having me. This was fun. Yeah.